that a party conducted with Tamil Nadu University from uh, 23rd to 25th January this year. So after this event, a party conducted a short survey to identify immediate needs of the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University staff to inspire the transformation from teachers into leaders that promote career development in agricultural professions. And in these surveys, the, the most highly ranked need that has been identified by you who participated in the survey was to make university lectures and seminars more interactive. So this is the main topic of the webinar. So overall, this webinar aims to enhance the participants' capacity to deliver more interactive lectures and seminars, to develop agriculture students' soft skills, such as confidence, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration and negotiation, and to help them become more innovative and empowered in their future careers in agriculture and rural development. So this webinar is planned for an hour and a half, and there will be space for questions and comments. And uh, I would like to now introduce my, the colleague, my colleague from Bangkok, uh, Michelle Bitong, who is a Paris uh, KM officer, and she is the lady behind the scenes. You don't see her, but sometimes you may hear her because she's doing the technical facilitation and she will try to ensure that all technical aspects are in place for the effective functioning of this webinar. And our colleagues Sha and Nguyen are with her to assist her. And I would like to remind the participants to turn off the mics and videos, those who are not speaking yet. Yeah? This will be open only for speakers and presenters. This is to ensure that there is no background noise and we can hear everything clearly. And the participants will only use the chat box that is, that is on the right panel of the blue uh, jean screen, where you can post your questions and comments um, during the webinar. We have also made arrangements for the participants in meeting rooms, where there will be some cards or some paper available, and there will be somebody collecting questions and comments from you. And then somebody will type them in the chat box, okay? So now I think it's time that we introduce today's speakers and the agenda. I will first just mention the names and the agenda, and then I will call you individually. So uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Ravi Ketapau, the Executive Secretary of APARI, and Dr. Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, who will welcome the participants. The second speaker will be Ms. Mariette Gross. She is the Head of Training Programs at the International Center for Development Oriented Research in Agriculture, called ICRA, based in the Netherlands. <clears throat> she will present uh, ICRA's experience and initiatives on making education work. The second speaker will be Dr. Dilep Kumar Buntuku. I hope he joined us by now. Uh, he's the president of ACTEC Innovation Lab in Iowa State University in the US, and he will present ACT MOOCs in flipped classroom to promote interactive learning in agriculture education. And the last speaker will be Dr. Tonet Laut, Assistant Professor, Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines. And she will present the topic, It's Fun to Learn the Science Behind Crops. Now, this webinar uh, will also be complemented with short videos that are depicting unique learning experiences that have been created by Professor Frank Robinson in his animal science courses in University of Alberta in Canada. And we are also hoping that Dr. Robinson will also join us in this webinar, so in case you have any questions following the videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you participants can make comments and questions to the speakers during each presentation and also after, since we will be collecting questions through the chat box, as I already mentioned. And we will cover them after each presentation, maybe a few questions, and then, and then uh, all questions after the last presentation. <coughs> so now to introduce the webinar, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Ravi Ketapal, Executive Secretary of APARI. Dr. Ketapal, before joining APARI, worked as Regional Director and Regional Advisor on Strategic Science Partnership of the Center for Agricultural Bioscience International Okabi, South Asia office. So please, Dr. Ketapal, welcome the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thank you everyone for being there. It's a pleasure to 
host this webinar from a Paris platform uh, where I would like to welcome first Dr. N. Kumar, Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, who is going to welcome everyone else actually. So I welcome him and all his galaxy of professors and students. Well, I, I, I'll be very brief. I'll be very brief in the introduction. I don't want to repeat what Martina has very succinctly explained and what Dr. Kumar is going to say. I would just like to say this webinar, when we talk of webinar, webinar itself is an innovation. It is an innovation of conducting seminar. It is a seminar on the web. It is called webinar. It is just a recap for many. Second point, very crucial, is about innovation. And most of you are now very clear what is innovation. But I may like to again have a recap on it. We should not confuse innovation with invention. If a discovery of a telephone was an invention, then when we had smartphone, that is an innovation. So I hope you can make out with that. When we invented telephone, it was invention. When we innovated smartphone, uh, it was innovation. Now, why this webinar on making university lessons more interactive? Why this webinar? And as Martina rightly explained, uh, as a follow-up workshop when we conducted a survey, this was the most highly ranked need which was revealed by the PNAU uh, staff and students who filled the questionnaire. So this is one of the webinar which we are conducting related to innovation, but innovation can be anywhere. It can be in the area of research. It can be in the area of development. It can be in the area of extension. We are now talking on one given topic of education today. And with the galaxy of experts who, who are going to make their presentations and interact with you all, I think this webinar is going to be very productive, very useful. And for APARI, I would like to say we, we have some expectations from this webinar. Our expectations are very clear. First of all, the capacity building or capacity development on agriculture innovation system what we are doing as a project with FAO to apply at TNAU. And gradually, along with TNAU, with the support of Dr. N. Kumar and his very good team of Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Shiva, and all, we would like this to be upscaled among more than 70, 75 universities of India, for which our discussions are going on with the Director General of Indian Council of Agriculture Research with the Deputy Director General Education of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and so also with the National Agriculture Higher Education Program, the project of World Bank. We would really like to upscale. Second objective for PARI is gradually we upscale it in the region. We work for Asia Pacific region. Then we take support from Dr. and Kumar and his team. We make projects, we work on it, and we try to ramify and replicate this phenomenon of innovation across the region as much as possible in the higher education sector. So with these few words, I would like to stop here, and I invite uh, uh, Dr. Kumar now, in fact, Martina will do the job, but I thank all the participants for being there. It is, Really very encouraging to see there are so many, so many participants who, who, who gave us overwhelming support to join this webinar. All the best to all of you. Please be interactive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, uh, for your inspiring introduction and the highlights of APARI's work with, with uh, partners in our agriculture education program. So. Uh, before calling Dr. Kumar, I would just like to remind the participants to turn off their speakers so that uh, their audio, so that there is no uh, background noise. 
I can see there are a few participants who keep their, uh, their audio on, so please make sure that it's off, except, of course, for Dr. Kennedy's uh, room. Okay, so now uh, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. M. Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, who has served the university for 30 years, right? If, if I'm correct, as the Dean of the Faculty of Horticulture and then a professor for 22 years. So, Dr. Kumar's leadership is based on a strong vision of making the results of agriculture research useful to farmers, and he's very committed to innovation and excellence at his university. So, welcome, Dr. Kumar. Please, the floor is yours. Also, my colleagues for the me to you. Very, I am happy to be part of this social committee for inviting or inviting lecturing organized by our host, School of Postgraduate Studies, not at the University, and for it. But I am very glad to be a part of the system because. The single reason I was a teacher for nearly 30 years. I handled 30 students, also up to 120 students at a time. They interact with more. That is the topic you have chosen. So, wherein I give much priority for eye to eye contact so that everybody is to be listening to me, to my talk, my lecture, and uh, go with. Of confidence, also knowledge is the my way of teaching. Generally, uh, the making lectures more interaction or interaction lectures involves the latest innovations like ink pressure, demonstrations, and role playing. They are very key indicators for our education is definitely different from our friends or our subject teaching. The pink patch share is very interesting in the sense it emphasizes collective learning strategy work. Each student or in pair can think or discuss on a particular subject then when he comes to the or he you know, where comes to the class, they can share their view with the other classmates or with the mentor or lecturer. So the whole idea we collect. This will be free. The knowledge system spreading very effective and the students will not forget their subject. This is the Basic of this first one, everything we have shared. Demonstrations, of course, that is our part and part of our uh, curriculum program. Most of our practical classes, we give demonstrations and hands on training, and the role playing is also very critical in our system. And as teacher, most of you are aware, aware that there are two types of learning. One is Deep learning, other one is surface learning. The deep learning means it results in overall understanding and it promotes long term retention of the learned materials and as important, it is it has the ability to retrieve it and apply to a new problem in unfamiliar person. This is what a interactive teacher should ensure. Yeah, plus more. On the other hand, surface learning, which will be used, uh, which will be easy for the students, but as a professional college student, this will not uh, give useful results as it is disconnected facts and road memorization. The routine lecture generally in our class is modern. The students will have the tendency.
say so passively listen or tend to listen but his brain will be going somewhere else so interactive teaching on the other hand will focus their attention to the class and they carry forward whatever they learn and try to apply in their life interactive lectures offers students engagement also that is they, it increases the students interest and students perception of their own learning how to give a interactive lectures it is a challenge for most of the uh, young generations but there are many who acquire this character also it involves creating and integrating interactive student activities with more traditional segments some of the steps which are recommended or which are basic for interactive lectures are engage in free instructional planning this the first step second step is free instructional sorry engagement further and learning task for the interactive segments third one is interactive lecture techniques that is it will be useful for instructors to consider their choice of techniques based on the categorization of the scheme of basic or intermediate or advanced techniques these classification differentiate the required preparation and class time as well as difficulty level today by reinventing the lectures they divide from the routine lectures we can build upon the established framework of professional teaching the staff students teaching and empowerment first to ensure that teaching for staff is minimal and the changes can be introduced at their pace best suited to the institutions post or individual lectures by offering connections for pre and post followers post lecture interaction and for learners of campus it introduces new opportunities for teachers for engaging with their learners and for the institutions to offer more flexible pathways into education i am grateful to all the presenters contributors from apari who gave their time and expertise so generously so generously in enlightening our peer teaching community about interactive lecturing i assure apari that peer will extend full cooperation so that we will be the first university in india to take up this model and we will be the uh, Board Model for the first of this university. I also congratulate all the participating teachers across the campuses of PAU connected online through ICT facility of this Vila. Thank you, Vila. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, for this inspiring uh, statement, and especially uh, the one you highlighted in the openness uh, of your university to innovation and to innovation innovative techniques that can really inspire students and also we would like to thank you for continuous uh, support in creating this exciting learning uh, environment for your staff and students like today's webinar and also the workshop we had in january so thank you very much okay so may i now invite ms mariet gross who is the head of training programs at ikra in the netherlands Uh, Mariette's training courses, held over the last 20 years, have helped hundreds of experts, facilitators, professors and advisors to improve their facilitation and negotiation skills. Mariette graduated in communication and innovation from Wageningen University in the Netherlands and she is a certified communication training, trainer. So today we, we are very uh, honored to also have her with us and she can start her presentation now. Mariette? The floor is yours. Okay. 
Okay, so while she's preparing her presentation, maybe I can just say that uh, uh, participants are free to ask questions or comments already during your presentation, so that after the presentation we can see something in the chat box that we can address with your help. Maria, can you enable audio, please? Uh, okay. Yeah, do you see me? And do you hear me? Yes? Okay, yes. hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mariette Gros, and uh, I'm, as uh, Martina said, head of training programs at ICRA. I train trainers, professors, teachers, and uh, after many years abroad, I now live in Wageningen. And, okay, let me open uh, my uh, presentation uh, and share it with you. Um, let me see. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, it's, it's popped yes? up right now. Yes, okay. we can see it's it. Pop up. Okay. okay, so uh, I'm, I'm at ICRA, and at ICRA we believe that the world needs more connection and trust to deal with complex problems uh, like the one of youth employment. So ICRA really helps to build that trust, and we do that through training, but also on-the-job coaching, process facilitation, and capacity building. And um, we have worked with many uh, universities. Uh, we have had several, well, quite a lot of participants from India and from the region in our courses. So based on what they have shared with us, I uh, uh, am making this presentation for you. And um, let me now go to... Um, the title of my presentation is Making Education Work from Motivating Students to Employed Graduates. And I think that's actually easier said than done, eh? because, um, well, what I often hear from uh, the people we work with is that it's not easy to find a job for, for graduates because they're actually lacking the skills that the employers are looking for. And, or, or they lack the skills that they need to start their own business. And um, what many university lecturers express that they realize we need more practice uh, in our classes, but how should we organize this with the limited time and the resources that we have? So that is uh, a struggle they have been expressing to us. And on the other hand, he also said, well, motivating students is, is not easy because, um, well, sometimes students are, doing, are sitting in your classroom, but they do other things, you know, they look on their phone, they are chit-chatting with, with the others, and you have invested a lot of time to prepare your sessions, your classes, uh, but then they're not paying attention, they don't seem to be uh, motivated, so that is sometimes frustrating, uh, but we at ICRA, we think that doesn't have to be like this. Eh? We really think you can organize your classes in such a way that they are closely linked to real life and uh, that it provides your student with a realistic outlook on a job. Um, and in our course, Making Education Work, it's a three-month month blended program. We help to achieve uh, this. And in this session, you will get a taste of it. Um, let me, oh, oops, this way. So uh, the, the outcome or what we like to offer you for this session is that you get insights on how to design your session in such a way that your students practice the skill they need to get a job. So that your classroom, as in this picture that I'm showing, as your classroom really gives a realistic view on how a job looks like for your students. So that is the, the promise for, for this session that I've prepared uh, for you. And well, I asked many lecturers, say, what are your big and biggest challenges or what are the questions that you are struggling with? And actually, the two key, key questions they always ask uh, me is, well, what do my students need to learn? And also, what, a, what approach to achieve this successfully? 
Um, and in this session today, we will focus on the on the second question. Uh, what? Uh, how do you organize the learning process that in okay. such way that your students actually really learn something they can use uh, in the in their future job? So one of the pitfalls in or the challenges lecturers often face or the, the pitfalls they fall in are um, that in their sessions it's only about talking and, and theory, no practice actually. And if there's no practice, there are no skills. And it's the skills that employers are looking for. And another thing uh, what is often uh, comes to mind is that what is explained in sessions is, uh, and in, your, in classes is often what and the why. So what should you do and why do you do it? So that the why is a very uh, important question to motivate students. However, what is often forgotten um, is to explain the how. How should students do something? Because if they know the how, they can practice uh, and they get skills. They will. They have a success experience, and that is also motivating. But if they do not know how, um, they might, might might fail in the practice, and that is then again demotivating. So really, make sure there's something on the how. Another challenge is uh, what I often hear from university lecturers is that, well, they explain theory and then they go to practice. But actually, the big, the gap between theory and practice is too too big. Eh? People need some, students need some time to to digest. Um, they need to know why they are doing it in the way they, uh, that you are explaining, and that it's not a trick. But they really know the underlying reason. What will happen if I don't do it in such way? So otherwise, the skills that you're teaching are not sustainable. And then the last thing is practice without work in context. So students are practicing, but they don't know actually why, while they're doing that. Let me give an example. I studied uh, in Wageningen, and I started with uh, tropical land use, with the technical training. And I had to learn a lot of uh, formula for hydrology, but I didn't have any clue how um, I was supposed to use that later back uh, when I got a job. It was only when I was walking transects and working on uh, soil erosion and that that I under that was like three or four years later that I understood. Oh, that's why I worked so hard on this hydrology uh, formulas. Well, in the end, I I decided to skip all the technology and look for the people and work with people. But just an example of how practice should be related to work context. Um, so now these are pitfalls. These are challenges that uh, our uh, alumni have expressed to us. Many uh, university lecturers have expressed to us. What I would like to share now with you is a model that People told us that it's very useful to organize their classes in such a way that it allows practice and really leads to uh, improving skills and perform performance so that graduates get a job. Um, so it is the model is about learning in steps. So if we look at the way people learn, first they need to know something. When they know it, they uh, the next step would to understand it. They really comprehend. They say, okay, now I get it. It has to be like this because, but then there's the next step, which is they have to be able to show a certain skill or certain competence um, before they're able to do it in real life. Um, and what we often uh, notice, notice is that this step of creating the ability to do something so that students are actually to sh able to show a certain skill or to show a certain competence, it is not well enough developed uh, for them to be, sh to be certain enough to really do it 
on the job. So this is how people learn. Now let us see what you can do as a lecturer to address these different steps. So let us imagine you're designing your session. If you know your students, the first step they need to know, well, what do you do? You give an explanation. Eh? What can you do to make them understand? Well, we call that an intermediate exercise. It's a small exercise that helps people to digest uh, the theory, the explanation that you just gave. The next step is like the core exercise. It is there where they practice the, the key skill that they need. And then um, that, by seeing the word core exercise and explanation, you, you might understand that the intermediary uh, exercise is between this core practice and your explanation. It helps them to digest and to come from knowing to understanding to able to. And then if they're able to, the chances uh, that they will do it in real life significantly increase. Um, it is the way brains learn, um, the chance that when people are able to do something in your classroom to actually do it in real life significantly increases. It is like having a small goat trail in your mind in the classroom and you want it to become a, a, a big highway in real life. Well, if they've never walked this small go trail, it will never become a highway in the brain. So you want to make sure you have practice in your classroom. And of course, part of your of education program is also often internships or other real life learning uh, sessions. So even the to do step uh, is possible to integrate in your education programs. So let me illustrate this a little bit with a concrete example. Let's imagine you're uh, a lecturer in uh, animal science and your students uh, will become like dairy farm managers uh, in the future. So one of the things they need to, to be able to do is make appropriate fodder mixes according to the different animals. So if you would, if that's the topic of your session, how should that, that look like uh, if, if we design it according to learning in steps. So for example, your explanation could be about the different fodder mixes per animal type and why a dairy cow should get something else in terms of fodder than a meat cow or where, why a goat should get something else as a cow. So that is your explanation. Then the next step, this exercise to make them digest a little bit your theory what you could do is you show them some examples of fodder mixes um, and you ask them, is it made correctly? Is it made according in line with the explanation that you gave? And if not, what will happen if this, uh, the fodder mix is not correctly uh, produced? So you, ex you make them digest your explanation. So that is an intermediary exercise. Then, what is a core exercise? The core exercise could be students uh, proposing and making a fodder mix based on available input. Uh, it could be a description of inputs available in a certain region, but you could actually even have the materials lying in your classroom and you say, okay, this is what is locally available. You're a farm manager. Now please prepare a fodder mix for a dairy cow or please prepare a fodder mix for uh, sheep that are kept for their wool. And they practice making this fodder mo uh, mix. A real life uh, uh, learning experience would then be working on a dairy farm, feeding the animals, but it could also be like a cons uh, consultant advising companies or farmers how to mix their fodders to increase milk production. So this is an example how a class related to uh, fodder mixes for animals could be designed based on uh, this model of learning uh, in steps. 
Um, now I have a question for you, actually. I want you to take uh, a minute and reflect on the question, what of these steps do you address in your courses? So just think for one minute and ask yourself these four different steps. Which of them do you address in your course? I will go up again so that you can see the different steps. So I'm curious to know which one of them do you uh, include in your sessions. Um, and then the a next question would, would of course be, um, if it's missing, what could you do to increase practice? Because at ICRA really we believe the learning is in the action and you should get as much action and practice in your classes as possible. And that is also uh, what we teach lecturers and uh, instructors at university and TVET colleges that we have in our course Making Education Work. Let me tell you a little bit about this course. Um, together with uh, uh, APARI, we are looking uh, in ways to uh, allow you uh, either to get to the Netherlands or do something together in India and to focus on these elements of how to conduct a labor market assessment and integrate employers' needs in your curricula. How do you design your sessions in which students practice these skills and need to get a job? So we will work on designing your courses according to learning in steps. How do you actually motivate students so that they active, actively participate in your courses? Uh, what can you do as a lecturer? And also, how do you give convincing presentations to your students using video tools? Uh, in a minute, I will already give you a small taster on that. And I think there's also another uh, speaker in this webinar who will talk about the use of video tools uh, in uh, making uh, your sessions more interactive. The course Making Education Work also addresses how do you design real life learning events beyond uh, maybe practical uh, internships, but there are other ways to organize real life learning for your students. So this is uh, what uh, you can learn uh, as part of the course Making Education Work. Um, well, as I mentioned, um, there are some videos um, to uh, inspire you a little bit more about our course Making Education Work. Um, and I think, uh, Martina, if I'm not mistaken, we can uh, show them to everybody. Am I right? Yes, yes. Uh, my colleague Sal uh, will try to run the first video. Uh, so may I please ask you to put the, the first video on, the top one. Should I stop sharing my screen? Um, uh, let's wait for Sal to put it. No, it's okay. You can still share, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sal, can you please put the first video on? Okay. Try again. Sal? Are you with us? Okay, <laughs> I think they are dealing with this uh, issue actually because uh, the the speaker from the US uh, yes, cannot here, get here, him here. on. So, so okay. can you please play the first video? So, I think that everybody is trying to wake up our second speaker uh, in my office in Bangkok. So, because uh, he's in the US, so I think that they are yeah. trying. That's why uh, there was a little bit of. Uh, lack of attention, so, so please play the first video. Can you see it now? Yeah, but we don't hear, so I don't hear sound. That now it's, are you seeing it, Martina? No. So no. can you please put it on? 
Yeah. Um, it was there. Let's wait a uh... few seconds. Yeah, it was there. I think Sally is trying to figure out the the sound because yesterday okay, we spent wait. some time with the technicians on this one. Okay. So should Mariette continue sharing her screen? No, she should. She should shut up. She should shut down. Okay, shut down yeah. the screen. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I so... think it's already done. Oh, yeah. May yeah. I think I stopped sharing, or I was kicked okay. out. Okay, Coming now up. I hear something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, to deliver the next generation of entrepreneurial and hands-on graduates. Creating exciting curricula that match the reality of the private sector and the demands of the labor market can be challenging. Welcome to our three-month blended learning program for lecturers and instructors at universities or vocational training centers. As you uh, develop your own materials for the course, as an output for the exercise, for instance, they really get the, your ex own experiences. So it's really learning by doing. Making education work helps you to make your classes interactive and match class material to your local context. Landed learning combines the advantages of group and peer-to-peer -peer learning in Wageningen in the Netherlands and digital on and offline learning instruments to coach you while you implement your new skills in your own context. I really enjoyed participating in this course. It has helped me to really look at my, my role as a teacher and I've picked out so many lessons that will help me to be a better teacher than I was before. ACRA is excited to work with you on transforming education for youth employment in the agricultural sector. Scholarships are available for this course. Find out more on www.acra.global/courses. Okay, I think there was a little bit of uh, sound luck, right? Yeah, but there was the sound was faster than, than the <laughs> images. So, uh, but okay, on I, I'm wondering if we should share the next video as well. If it's difficult, um, but yeah, I leave it up to you. Do you want to yes, share please. the next video? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let okay. us try. Maybe you can explain a little bit about the video. Um, yes, I will. So the video you just saw, we just finished, was just a small uh, impression of the course we do in the Netherlands. Um, and one of the sessions that we also do is about fl the concept of flipping the classroom. I think later in the webinar you will hear more about it. But for us the purpose of this flipping the classroom is to create more time for practice in actual classrooms and leave the theory, uh, present the theory in another way using video. And so this video that you will now see is also one that we use in our classes. Uh, participants watch it at night and then during the, during the actual session, training session, they are learning how to make their own videos uh, in order to present it to their students. So you will now see the Explain it. You will see me explaining the concept of flipping the classroom. Um, so, Cell, can you uh, put on the next video, please? Let us try and see if it works. Okay, so next video, please. Yes, yes. When we don't hear you, we worry. <laughs> So everybody, um, you as lecturer and trainer, you aim for graduates to get a job as soon as possible after their graduation. But we have all together um, noticed that practice is very important, but often we do not find enough time in our courses to make students practice. So uh, a lot of trainers and teachers all around the world, they have now uh, used flipping the classroom as a way to deal with this challenge. So in this video, I will explain you what is flipping the classroom, why do it, and how to do it. 
So let me start by explaining what is flipping the classroom. Traditionally, we see that a lecturer or trainer explains theory in class and your students listen. At least that's what we hope. Sometimes they look at their phone, they get bored or they do other things. And after the class, students at home do uh, apply and practice uh, the homework that you give to them. Like, let me give an example. You're a teacher in hydrology. You explain them certain formula that they might use to, on how to build a dam. And then back home, they will practice with this formula um, and face, sometimes also face problems while you're not there helping them. This is uh, how traditionally teaching is working. Now let us look at flipping the classroom. With flick, flipping the classroom, students study theory, so the formulas on hydrology uh, back at home, by watching a video. Like you now are watching a video on the concept of flipping the classroom. And then in class, students go and practice the tools, the skills, the instruments, in your case, making a video with the help of the teacher. Uh, the lecture. So what is done at home and what is done in the class is flipped around. What is the advantage of flipping the classroom? So one advantage is students can learn at their own pace. They can look at the video one time, two times, three times and whenever they want. Um, so they can learn at their own pace. At the same time, as you are there uh, when students practice and apply the essential skills and really instruments, you are there as a teacher uh, to assist them at the level which is needed. So student A might need different help than student B. Other advantage is also that you en can engage much more with your students. You can have discussions or organize projects. Uh, in such a way that they apply the competence that they need. So now let me explain how to flip the classroom. What you need is exercises or assignments that you want your students to do in your class. And you need a video on the topic that you will teach. Uh, this video you can find on the internet. But you can also make one of your own, like we are doing now. Um, tomorrow, um, you will make a video in the class with the help of my colleague, Tessa Steenberg. Let me introduce you to her. This is Tessa. Hi. Well, I will give you now um, just a couple of very important tips on how you can make a video. That will help you a lot to improve the quality. The first is always make sure you have enough light and make sure you have a neutral background. For example, like this one. Um, this means no disturbing movements, colors, objects or text behind you because that might distract the attention of the audience. Um, second is you have to make sure the sound is captured clearly. Um, the best thing you can do is to find a quiet room and uh, make sure you are close enough to the microphone, especially when you film on a uh, telephone or tablet, the microphone is not very strong. So uh, make sure you are close uh, to your camera uh, to capture the sound clearly. And the last tip I want to give you is to stabilize your camera to have a quiet or a stable image. For example, you can use a tripod, which we will show you tomorrow also how, to, how it works um, to stabilize your camera. Or if you don't have it, um, make sure that you hold the camera firmly and um, uh, pre press your arms against your body. So you will be a kind of natural tripod. So these three tips will help you, I hope will help you to improve your video if you, when we practice yeah. tomorrow. Okay, thanks Tessa. So um, last thing I want to uh, share with you is the preparations you are asked to do for tomorrow. So tonight or this afternoon, uh, I want you to make groups of three. 
probably we have one group of four, but ma make sure you're already organized in groups and you are asked to think of a lesson or a class which you want to flip. So for which you want to... Okay, uh, I think we had some problems with the video. Uh, this is not uh, our fault. It's a technical uh, fault that we actually we were testing yesterday with the blue jeans technicians and it worked. <laughs> so uh, we apologize about that. But uh, what we are going to do, we are going to show also other videos and if they don't work, we are going to send you all the videos by email to all the participants because this was actually the original plan, but we have been trying to integrate them. So uh, you can learn about uh, this flip, uh, flip, uh, um, skipping the flipping the classroom actually uh, even after the webinar. But I think our colleague uh, Dilek also from the US will be explaining the concept how it has been applied. Yeah. So okay, Maria, please. Okay, well, it's a pity, but uh, it doesn't matter. I think um, you you can share my PowerPoint presentation with everybody, and the links uh, to these videos are in there. It was just to give you a taste of how uh, we organize our classes and to illustrate that we really try to practice what we preach. So if we learn... Uh, lecturers and trainers, how to make a video. We also do it ourselves and we, as you, you could see, it was a very low profile, not fancy uh, video. It was just me and a flip chart and uh, a video camera on a tripod filming uh, us to, to, to illustrate that it doesn't have to be very professional. It can work and will help and it will serve the purpose that there's not a lot of talking and theory in your classes, but you create more time and space uh, for practice. And actually, th this is what uh, we think will make uh, education uh, yeah, effect more effective um, in such a way that your students are more motivated, are more actively participating. If you use video, it's very hip and trendy, so they will be triggered by that. And also, um, if you organize your learning in, in steps, um, it will allow you to make them practice and gather the skills they need to find a job after their graduation. So <laughs> I hope the, this model of learning in steps um, helped to achieve uh, the objectives uh, of today. Uh, let me share my screen one more time. Um, which was, um, can you see it? Yes. Screen? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. see it. So screen. my promise mm -hmm. was to provide you with insights on how to design sessions in such a way that students can practice the skills they need to get a job. So I hope with this presentation I've fulfilled that promise. And I really look forward to uh, collaborate with uh, APARI and uh, Samuel uh, Nadu Agricultural University to uh, go into this deeper. And I look forward also to your questions or to your remarks. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Mariette. Uh, thank you very much Let for these interesting through. insights <laughs> on how to design sessions and also the learning steps. Uh, uh, again, it doesn't matter that the video did not work because the participants will be able to watch it. Uh, after the webinar, we will send it to everyone. And I also appreciate that you mentioned the collaboration with APARI because what we have been trying to do in the context of our pilot project with uh, the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, we are trying to get this course to Tamil Nadu, whether it is through uh, designing this course, uh, of course, in a tailored manner uh, in India or bringing the participants to the Netherlands. So we are currently looking into the possibilities and modalities and of course the funding, how to make this, uh, how to make this happen. Yeah. So uh, I think it's time to introduce the next speaker. But before I do that, uh, we are wondering... Uh, can you tell me a little bit of how we handle the questions? Yes, yeah. Yes, so the question should be coming in the chat box now. And some comments, I think some comments are coming on the uh, learning steps. 
And somebody is saying that in uh, his or her teaching, I used to follow 70% with talk and talk and 30% with smart board. Is it okay? If you have a look in the chat, uh, Mariette, yeah. there is uh, one um, common question. And I would invite participants to uh, post more comments and questions for Mariette. Um, yeah, okay. So if I, if I look at this question, um, 70% with chalk, does it mean uh, chalk writing on the blackboard and and talk and 30% with smart bo boards? Well, it depends. Um, I, I really, if you want to create skills, competence, you need uh, uh, students to actually practice something. So if a smart board and chalk allows them to practice, then it's fine. Um, but what you want to avoid is that they're just listening and watching, but you want them to do things themselves, think themselves, analyze themselves, apply themselves. Um, I think without uh, application of skills, they they cannot uh, become confident in it, and then the chance they will apply it uh, in their job uh, gets limited. So. Uh, in that sense, the question is hard to answer. It depends if the, the smart board or the, the chalk and talk uh, includes exercises for practicing, then it's fine. Otherwise, I would say, okay, uh, maybe go for 30% uh, talking with, with chalk and 70% practice in exercises. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Mariette. I think at the moment there are no questions, but that's okay because we would really like uh, our participants to keep asking. And you know, uh, because we have uh, the webinar projected in a few meeting rooms, so it might take some time to collect the questions and then type them in the chat box. Yeah. So okay. again, participants, well, please uh, give your questions on a piece of paper uh, to your colleague in the meeting room who is also going to uh, type them in the chat box. There is another question yeah. coming. How much time to be spent for theory and for practice? What would you advise? So if, let, let us say, if you have, have one session that uh, lasts 45 minutes, I would say 50 uh, minutes for theory explanation and then, um, yet another 10 to 15 minutes for the in, intermediate exercise and the rest for practice. And practice can also be um, like, uh, I don't know, doing cost-benefit uh, analysis. It doesn't have to be always a physical uh, practice. It can be something that is organized in your, um, in your classroom. Uh, it can also be practical like, um, um, how to make packaging for fruit juices, or th then you need some uh, some equipment. So, but I would say, if you, if you have 45 minutes, 15, 15, 30. Um, so more practice than uh, explanation. So if okay. you would say that in percentages, uh, yeah, I would say like uh, 30, 30, 40. So 40% okay. for for practice. Right. Yes. Yeah. And and even the 30% intermediate exercise, that's already reflection about application. So you could say the the, the theory is no. The the um, intermediary exercise is to know how, and the practice is that the students show how, that they can do it. So that is uh, yeah. That's 30, 30, 40. Okay. Okay. Th thank, thank you, you Maria. Are there any other oh, questions? I, yeah, I'm ready for him for them. Okay, I don't I don't think there are other questions, but they they might be coming later. Okay, so please continue, continue yeah. asking questions on the piece of paper and then uh, uh, transmitting them in the chat box. Or those who are uh, who are having individual computers, just type them directly, and we will consolidate them after all the presentations have been made. Okay, so for now, I would like to thank Mariette. Yeah, uh, bye bye. And I, I see uh, from the next uh, presentation, uh, flipping the classroom will be further explained. So that is great. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So.
Okay, so, thank you, uh, Martina, thank you for much. organizing this uh, and taking thank up you. this challenge of so many yeah. people uh, joining. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, and please stay with us for, for, for the time being. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Okay. I will mute so, my, ca my uh, mic microphone now. Perfect. Okay? Thank you so much. Okay, so now our next speaker is Dr. Dilap Kumar Guntuku. He is the president and founding director of uh, ACTEC Innovation Labs, located at the Iowa State University Research Park in Iowa, USA. And he will talk about these agricultural MOOCs in Fleet's classroom to promote interactive learning in agriculture education. Uh, DILEP currently provides leadership to the design and development of next generation of ACTEC innovations. And prior to joining ACTEC Innovation Labs, he worked at the Science Center. Uh, Sorry, Seed Science Center at Iowa State University as a global program leader. So, Dilep, are you with us? Martina, can you hear me? Perfectly, we can hear you perfectly. So Wonderful. the floor is yours and you can start your presentation. Oh, thank you so much, Martina. Can, can you see me? We can see your presentation which you can actually uh, enlarge so that uh, it's on the, the entire screen. Okay. Can you make it full screen, please? Can you see now? I think it's a little bit slow, but it's, it's coming. We're still seeing Mariette's presentation. Oh, okay, it's good now. Okay. So I think it's not enlarging on the full screen. I don't know why. I did, Martina. You did already? Okay, so maybe it's gonna take some time. Okay, it's, I think it's coming. It's coming now. Now we can see success is a journey, not a destination. I think that is the... Oh, okay, then maybe let me do it this way. Is it one of your slides? No, no. I think that's your desktop, isn't it? It's my desktop. I okay. have three screens. So just wait. As you can see, with webinars, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so we just have to be patient. OK. Well, if you cannot enlarge it, that that's fine. Uh, you, let, you can just continue. I mean, you can you can you can start your presentation and then uh, okay. we'll just move the slides. Okay. Thank you, Martina. So, do I say good afternoon? Yes. Good afternoon for our Indian participants. <laughs> good afternoon, Martina, and. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity to you as well as uh, Dr. Peter Paul for thinking of I'm worthy enough to be part of this important webinar. Of course, it's a topic interest to me and uh, the other reason why I wanted to become on this webinar because it's a long-term association with the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University at various stages, I think like I first given a webinar in 2012, then again, that's on learning objects repository. And then uh, on the distance learning approach, as I, I visited their center too, I still remember there are some and who are very active in this area. And again, in 2019, it's, it's the evolution process to introduce the new approach, which we call AgMOOCs and Flip the Classroom to Tamil Nadu Agriculture University and also their faculty members and uh, the other important participants who are listening to this one. Thank you for this one. Before going into the details, so I never expected that I would uh, come to India this quickly. In just two minutes, just to hear Dr. Ketrapal woke me up from the bed and uh, bring me to the webinar that fast. Though technology sometimes bring the difficulties, but make these things so easily. Thank you. And coming to the topic, 
When I say that ad MOOCs and flip the classroom to promote interactive learning and agriculture education, just wanted to introduce about the ag MOOCs, the concept, and uh, why we say the flip the classroom, and then maybe learning experiences from two inaugural pilots, then maybe what's the next steps, how do we need to move forward and take these things for the practical point of view for the higher educational institution. So coming to the MOOC, so some of you might have heard of this one. The MOOCs, it stands for four letters, M-O-O-C-K, and it's called Massive Open Online Courses. Coming to the agricultural MOOCs, especially deal with the agriculture education subject. So you could see the picture here. So this is a typical classroom structure from the generations. And way back, I think like more than 500 years before, like how we use it to see the gurus, they use it to teach uh, the students under a tree and the knowledgeable teachers impart their knowledge to the students. And it all depends on the student it, teachers, how best they are. And that's way like students use it to get the knowledge. And the, in, the, in the coming generations, you could see now we are seeing with the big computer screens, LCD projectors and everything. What has not been changed in all these years and from the, this particular approach, the four-sided classroom and which could accommodate only few students and not more than that one. But when we are looking at the next generation, it's uh, the students who are dealing with the computers, laptops, and the tablets day to day in their lives. And even we can see two years or three years old kids, they are playing with the mobile phones. It's pretty significant even in India, because even I still remember there was an article by Hindu and there are more toilets than the, more telephones than the toilets. That's what the article headlines in the first phase. And it's no difference at my home also. You could see my son, and we sometimes uh, communicate each other over the electronic gadgets rather than face-to-face -face, uh, communication. If he needs something, and he sends me a message during my travels also, and also the details and the prices, and I get that one. And even uh, if I need to pick him up from his school or classes, he sends the message. That's how the things are working very well. That means we can see how the technology playing a bigger role. Of course, it's not in the current days, even way back, the distance learning is part of our culture to enhance the capacities of the professionals who has day-to-day -day responsibilities. And even Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, they have open distance learning. I still remember there was a professor named Paul Vidakashanti, whom I have worked with, and some of these concepts, and also the vice chancellor of school, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, former vice chancellor, who was part of some of these initiatives, I think it's one. That's the time we did uh, some online platform and the demand straight what's the difference between the traditional classrooms and the virtual learning. But the earlier generation online platforms has some restrictions. If the number go beyond 8,000 and the servers collapse, that's where the technology brings the challenges and the problems. But fortunately, thanks to the advances in the computational technology, which is providing us an opportunity to see how best even we can accommodate the classrooms without limitations on the number. So it could be 100,000, it could be 150,000, it could be million also. That's the powerful platforms it's bringing. So that's why we call these are the classrooms which can accommodate massive open online courses. And the main objective of these MOOCs is to offer a quality education to the most remote centers and connect to the good faculty members and uh, to ensure how best we can improve their capacities or enhance their capacities to make them competitive individuals in this highly competitive world.
Other than that one, the networks are also extremely important. But coming to the MOOCs, there are two components that are extremely important. How we need to model the content and how we need to provide a runtime environment also that's extremely important in this particular approach. So it's all the video-based content and it should not exceed more than 10 to 12, 12 minutes, but sometimes it could be extended 20 minutes also because sometimes we need to deliver a specific instruction in, the, in, the, in these learning objects. And uh, the quizzes should be integrated with the lectures and the teaching assistants and the professors moderated discussions and the discussions in the comment space would be available. You can see on the interface, I'm going to show you in my next slides and to promote the online participants, the badges and the certificates are part of this one. Yeah, this me, is uh, in Dilep, sorry, sorry, Dilep, just sorry to interrupt you, but we've heard from some participants that uh, their sound is echoing. So your sound basically, is, is there any way you can uh, control it so that, it, that there's no echo? I mean, for me, it's fine, oh, but yeah. I think for the, for the people in the meeting room. Please see if it's if it's possible. Yeah, I can. Probably, maybe if I use the. Are you using the headphones? I'm using laptop, Martina. Probably, let me use the headphones. Maybe that helps. Yeah. Okay now. Uh, okay, try to speak a little bit more. Is it okay now? Can you hear me? For me, it's okay, but I'm not sure for the others. Let me hear some feedback from them. Just. Uh... Yes, it's okay to us. Is it okay? Good. Okay. Okay, so let us continue. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Is it clear now? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay. So this kind of approach started in 2012 when some of you are aware of the MIT Open Courseware platform and that's the same institute together with Harvard University. They brought this uh, edX platform and uh, started offering some courses and other than that Stanford University, they started the two different platforms which called the Coursera and the other one is the Udemy, some of you are aware of that one. And uh, when it started, like uh, during the time 2012, and from that time to 2014, you could see the significant growth from Norway to 20 million users taking the courses of 2,500. But uh, the same thing in 2017, the study conducted in 2017 shows the significant growth of 2,000 Courses to 6,850, offering by 700 universities and 58 million users taking advantage of that one. But unfortunately, not many courses on agriculture. So most of the courses are either engineering courses or the management courses. So this is where a couple of universities come together and uh, started offering by conducting an inaugural pilot in 2014 and uh, that's the same state first time it was launched in Tamil Nadu and uh, offered to three different universities by recruiting the students by opening this platform only and for 15 days and we were able to attract participants. The platform offers this kind of structure, the analytics, we can see like how many students 
actually enrolled in this one, what's their age groups and the calendar of the events, what's the courses. So the structure and after looking at this one, so the interface appears on this platform. After we content model and we can upload the video modules onto this platform, you could see every week there are seven video modules at a length of 8 to 15 minutes, it could extend 12, 20 minutes too. But every day we get a video of 7 minutes or 8 minutes to 15 minutes. And for a week, it's almost like an hour lecture. We can see this one. At the end of the week, we could see the self-evaluation exercises. And we offered this one. And then uh, it also provides uh, the discussion forums to help understand what the course and how the course is happening, what's the perception levels of the students. So even if the instructor and uh, posted some questions and also at the same time participants, they can post their questions also. But before that one, if you can look at uh, the video content modeling, how this needs to be modeled, I can show a small video Martina, the videos are working? Um, unless you send it to my colleague, Sal. She normally plays the videos. Uh, so okay. you, you, cannot, you cannot play it yourself because you probably don't have the feature. But the thing is, we've had no, uh, some problems with the videos in any case. So we, can, we will send it after the webinar. Sure. Okay, you can just explain. I mean, you just explained, but I know you wanted to show us. Uh, but we will send it later. Okay, so it allows to get the feedback. So you could see like uh, any time, so the students can write and post on this one. This is where like how we are facilitating in this kind of approach, the learning interaction patterns between the student and the content and between the student and the instructor and the student actualized to the other students and the peers and the students with the discussion forums are the interface and sometimes we can follow the Bloom's taxonomy and sometimes any other particular model to enable this learning interaction so we can see the feedback what it has been received and even the time like a student from Tamil Nadu Agricultural University and participating in this particular pilot experiment from the plant breeding and genetics. Writing it is a great opportunity for students. I am very much interested in the traditional knowledge. So if you cover traditional practices for disease management, it will be very much useful. And other than that, when some of the students writing, you could see, is there any schedule of new year course related to horticulture available? When the student series part of this course is available on site. How we have conducted, when we first started this one, this pilot experiment, we have identified what are the courses being offered in the universities during that time. So then we actually model the content of those particular courses and make it available on the edX platform. So then uh, we offered these courses. This provided an opportunity for the students first to watch the videos before they go to the so you could see the video lectures are online, but when they are in the classroom and these are on site, how we are flipping the classroom from online to on site to enable more interaction. Since they have an opportunity to expose, get an exposure to the content and understand that one, that provides more opportunity for the students to participate in the interaction. So at the same time, after implementing the successful diseases of horticultural man. And we started a new program called the Massive Open Online Courses for promoting the seed education. This pilot was conducted to provide the learning opportunities for the students in the United States, as well as in the Western Africa, especially in the Ghana region. 
So it has eight modules and uh, to provide and to facilitate the learning experiences for the seed inspectors, extension officers, students, as well as the faculty members. So this was also proven and uh, to show even the technology could be reached to the remote corners of the world, the West African part where this was a difficult area. So what the expert says across the globe, if you can see former, the president of Commonwealth of Learning and mentioning about the MOOC will have an important impact in two ways, importing teaching and encouraging institutions to develop distinct And the most important thing, what we need to understand, technology today allows us to customize our education according to the learning styles, and that this can be done without harming the traditional brick and mortar schools. That's what like we could see, how we are flipping the classroom from online to on-site, and as well as from on-site to online. And what could be possible in future, one is how we are flipping the classroom. And the other one is the even the hybrid learning approaches in a typical on-site environment. When I mentioned the hybrid learning approaches in a typical university, even the students still, still get the courses online before they come to the class and then put them in more into an interaction mode. Other than that one, the distance learning courses could take best advantage of this kind of platforms. How that could be possible, if you could do, remember in the previous slides, I mentioned badges and the certificates. So for example, if this is a course of one year and uh, during the orientation for one okay. week, we can bring the students okay. to the college and we can provide an orientation and they can go back to their respective places to participate in their day-to-day -day activities, day-to-day uh, -day job responsibilities, continue their education and online more. But at the end of the course, they can come back to the university and still take the examination or complete the requirements to fulfill the uh, examinations or the other assignments, then uh, they can obtain their certificates. So that this is going to be the future. And still we could see, though we have these flip the classrooms in knowledge cloud to promote the intellect learning in agricultural education for next generation, but still we need to have some traditional classrooms to show the next generation to see like how we use it to learn from the teachers in a typical traditional classroom set. So how we are bringing this kind of technology platforms from 20 to 30 in a typical on-site setup to several hundred, several thousands to the students to enable access to a good quality content, to enable access to a good faculty member, at the same time connecting them to the various participants across the globe. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. I will be online and listening to the other lectures. And if you have any questions, please post it on the chat window. I will follow them. Thank you, Martina, and thank, thank you, Dr. Peter Paul, for providing this opportunity. And also thanks to the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University for taking this new initiative and always showing a new direction to the higher education in agriculture, especially in India. Thank you again. Thank you, Dilat, very much. Uh, thank you for presenting the concept and opportunities uh, of these ad MOOCs and also the value that they add to the curricula. Also, what was interesting to see, you know, how to flip the classroom from online to offline and that already, you know, some uh, participants from Tamil Nadu participated in your, in your pilot. Um, it's also, of course, exciting to see that you have been involved in the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University uh, through some uh, prior uh, work and, and, and projects. So we hope that this collaboration also uh, can continue in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, I would like you. to invite uh, uh, our participants to post questions or comments in the chat box, if they have any. As I said earlier, uh, in, the, 
in the meeting rooms where we are projecting this webinar, it takes some time to perhaps collect these, uh, these questions and comments. And I would also like to add that uh, Dilek is speaking from the States, from Iowa. So it is very early for him. And I really appreciate that you managed to uh, wake up, you know, interrupt your sleep and, and come to be with us um, today. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, so the questions and comments might be coming, but uh, there's nothing in the mailbox, sorry, in the, in the chat box at the moment. Um, so what we can do, we can uh, invite the next speaker and then come back uh, and address some of the questions and comments later, if that's okay with you, Dilep. Okay. So I would like to invite our last speaker today, uh, Dr. Toned Laude. Uh, she's the assistant professor of Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines. And she will present the topic, it's fun to learn the science behind crops. Through her 17 year experience of service in her two year her university, she has demonstrated excellence in teaching and research and also mentored and graduated many students from this university. Her significant years of work experience in corn breeding uh, breeding contributed to the identification of superior corn populations for better nutrition, of which she was also recognized as one of the 2016 Outstanding Young Scientists from the National Academy of Science and Technology. And I would like to mention that Dr. Tonet is, Tonet is also integrating a lot of uh, fun activities for students that is enabling them to get, uh, you know, experience and, and practice on the subject that she is teaching. So I would like to invite Dr. Tonet, please. The floor is yours. You may please uh, share your screen with us. Okay. Uh, can you see it, Martina? Yes, I can see it. Can you please try to enlarge it and see what happens? Because we were not able to do uh, yeah. it in... Okay, there it is. Okay. So I hope that all our, part all our participants can now see it clearly. Thank you. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Martina, for, my, for the invitation. So for this... Um, it's evening now in our time. So uh, I will be discussing the fun ways to learn the science behind crops. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will discuss a little bit about my institution and then discuss what do we want our graduates to be, being um, a university shifting to outcomes-based education and learning who are our students and then how can we make classroom learning fun. So my institution is the Institute of Crop Science. It is um, one of the nine institutes in the University of the Philippines, Los Paños, under the College of Agriculture and Food Science. We have five uh, divisions, the Crop Biotechnology, the Crop Breeding and Genetic Resources Division, the Crop Physiology Division, the Crop Production and Management Division, and then the um, Post-Harvest and Seed Sciences Division. So, um, we are proud that our graduates are among the best in their fields and acquired top positions in research institutions, private companies, and government and policy-making institutions. So um, it gives us some confidence that our program um, enables to deliver what the industry is um, needing. So this is the value chain analysis applied for um, the College of Agriculture and Food Science undergraduate programs, where one of them is the Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. So um, each program has a set of uh, general education courses, foundation courses, core courses, major courses, and specialization courses. I want to highlight on the major courses because um, for the Crop Science, Institute of Crop Science, we have two major courses under the are two major programs under the Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. So for BS Agriculture, we have 10 um, major programs, two from the Institute of Crop Science, Agronomy and Horticulture. We have the Animal Science, we have the uh, Agricultural Systems, um, Landscape uh, Agroforestry, we have the Agricultural Extension, we also have um, 
plant pathology, entomology, and with science. So all of them are under the program of the BS Agriculture. And then we do um, have also specialization courses that this is usually, these are usually in line with their um, expertise development, such as the, their research, and then their internship or major practice. Like what um, Mariet mentioned earlier on um, the employers are looking for practice. We also felt that during our stakeholders consultation meeting, and hence we want to enhance the partnership with the industry to help us develop this um, aspect here, expertise development um, in terms of skill and independent research. We also provide our students or give opportunities to some of our students on the ex ex student exchange programs, allow them to attend also scientific meetings and fora, and then um, in, um, intensify our um, local and international networks. So um, considering all of these um, uh, activities, all of these um, components of the program, we um, intend to um, develop graduates who are science-based, modern, and industry responsive, attuned with emerging issues in global agriculture. So right now we are shifting from the teacher-centered approach to the learner-centered approach according to the outcomes-based education. So we want, based on the um, outcomes-based education, we want to learn who are our students. And with the 21st century learners, we know that their behavior as compared when we are the students um, are different. Their attention span are getting shorter. They need to have more interactive learning. And just like, um, based on my experience, um, my students are more, um, have more confidence presenting their, their work or doing some presentations rather than their written, written outputs. And with that, we need to uh, adapt to those changes because uh, their le learning and then their, um, how, how they present themselves are um, different from how we are taught years back. So how do we make classroom learning fun? So we need, based on um, what I have mentioned earlier, we need to respond to our students. We need to know their perspective. And um, the, one of my colleagues uh, shared this with me. Um, this is one of the activities he presented in his class. And he asked his students on what is a farm to them. So this was... Um, a classroom activity and he provide them some sheets of paper, allow them to write, write on those sheets of paper and then categorize their answers. So the information were gathered, uh, processed and then categorized and this is the output of their work. So based on them, based on their understanding, based on their perspective on what is a farm, um, it was categorized from the planet perspective or the environment, people perspective, and then the profit. So basically, there's a number of sheets of paper um, on evolving, um, involving the planet or affecting the planet. So the farm, farms are based on animal breeding, crops, trees, weeds, uh, land, fertilizer, etc., water system, etc., so for the people, it's generally the farmers, and they also highlighted that, uh, pointed out that um, farm uh, or the people in the farm are food producers. And it, we need also to highlight the importance of profit because for farming is an enterprise. So we need to get some profit. What are our inputs, our outputs? Are we earning in the farm or not? So all of these are inputs from the student, okay? Another activity, an interactive activity, is um, the students are allowed to draw an upland and lowland agroecosystem. So they are grouped into um, decent number of students, three to four students or four to five students in each group. Um, they allowed uh, the the uh, professor allowed them to discuss and then illustrate. 
illustrate their uh, output and then this is what they come up on their understanding of the agroecosystem so it can some of the students um, independently illustrated the upland agroecosystem with the lowland agroecosystem agro but there are some that enables them to integrate the lowland and upland ecosystem okay another um, way to make um, learning fun while we are studying crop science is learning by doing so in one of our courses fundamentals in crop science our first exercise is to be familiar with the crops we need to know the crops um, what are the economically important crops? And then the second exercise, which is this, is identification of morphological characters associated with productivity, adaptability, and marketability. So the different parts of the plant, starting from the roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, and the fruits, they are categorized. And we would like to identify if the characters are associated with um, productivity for high yield, for adaptability, if they can um, be adapted to some stress, like um, the deep roots um, can serve as an adaptive mechanism to control soil erosion and to conserve water as well. Uh, the waxy layer in the leaf can prevent excessive transpiration. Um, there are also some features on, on the flowers that um, the market is looking after for the aesthetic purpose. And for the fruits, there are certain fruits that um, is dictated by the consumer. So all of these are discussed. And then um, we also ask the inputs from our student. Hence the discussion in this manner. They are um, seated in circle so that each uh, of the student can see um, their classmates and allow them to participate in the group. Okay, another um, learning by doing approach is the biointensive gardening. Uh, this is set up early in the semester. For our class, we have um, for a course, there are 16 weeks. So this is usually set up on the second week so that um, by the end of the semester, they can harvest what they planted. So the students are the ones planting, the, planting on the field, um, watering them, doing the weed management, etc. And um, the key in this bio-intensive gardening is to promote diversity um, in the crops, uh, nutrient management, water management, pest management, and um, crop preservation. So those are some key features of the biointensive gardening and then after some weeks the students are able to harvest what they planted and we calculate also um, in economic terms the the yield and then put some costs so that they appreciate it more so ideally it would be good if they can for a given piece of land they can cost um, how much um, they can get from that piece of land and then translate it to profit so that um, they have a better appreciation of their of the crops and of the work that they have done okay uh, uh, it is also common to us that when we're out in the sun it's fun so it's more fun in the sun so there are different um, crops that are visited, like what I have mentioned during uh, the previous slide where I told, uh, where I discussed about the crop identification. So we go around uh, the different setups in the university for the different crops, um, vegetables, fruits, ornamentals, um, agronomic crops, so just for the students to be familiar, because most of them, although they are studying agriculture, some of them came from urban areas. And um, sometimes they don't know the difference between a corn and the rice. So um, it is sometimes a first experience to them to see 
uh, these different crops and how they are differentiated from one another. Uh, this is an edible landscaping um, that is organized by the crop protection and ma uh, crop production and management division. So um, it is a combination of ornamentals and um, edible plants, which are normally vegetables, and they are arranged in an aesthetic manner for a beautiful landscape. So we have here um, a purple sweet potato, and then these are, uh, what do you call this? Uh, yellow sweet potato. There are some herbs that are used for culinary purposes. Uh, to maximize area, especially, uh, this is um, how we respond to the decreasing um, land area for production and cultivation. So we can do rooftop gardening or vertical gardening, just like what you see on the screen. So we have here the different plants. They are all edible. You can also set it up on the roof of the buildings and then make some creative um, planting uh, arrangement so that you can maximize the space while um, keeping the aesthetic of it. Okay. Um, in this slide, we have here the Jardin de Herbas, or uh, in English, it's a herb, herbal garden. So herbs that are planted here are for culinary and medicinal purposes. This topiary here is uh, our oblation because the university is symbolized by an oblation for um, academic freedom. So this was um, crafted to show that um, image. And this is made of chaangubat. Chaangubat is a uh, Carmona retusa. It is an herb. And then there are also some herbs here that are used for culinary purposes. The plantation crops nursery showcases um, coffee, cacao, and rubber trees. Um, there are also some uh, vanilla plant, abaca, and others that are planted in the area. So aside from learning within the university, we also bring our students outside and um, learning from the experts themselves. So we have a visit to learning laboratory in agroforestry, a visit to agrometeorological station to understand the weather data, how the weather data are gathered, and relate it to the needs in crop production. And then there's also a visit to a commercial vegetable farm in Tagaytay City. Okay, so this is the learning laboratory for agroforestry where they showcase different soil and management conservation measures. So you, um, it is not only in lowland or in plain areas that we can do cultivation, we can also do cultivation in, um, in the forest. Hence, there's the agroforestry. But we need to regulate, do some regulation or do some control measures not to promote soil erosion. This is the visit to Agromet Station where weather data are gathered for rainfall data, um, wind velocity, air temperature, and others, and then relate it to um, the crop reduction needs. Uh, this is the visit to the commercial farm in Tagaytay City. Um, it is, um, it's good to see some best practices and how the industry works. So there are some lettuce, um, vegetables, and um, if you can see here at the bottom side of the screen, um, the prolific tomato. So um, it is um, a good way to expose um, our students to this kind of um, environment and to also learn from them. Okay, so that is from learning from the experts, but in terms of output, how can we harness our students' creative minds? So we designed some um, activities for them to submit and worked on to in, um, be more innovative and creative in doing their um, 
submitting their outputs. So um, on this uh, left side of the screen, the top commercial vegetables produced in the Philippines was um, prepared by a group of students um, under the Horticulture 20 course. This is on vegetable production. So the professor asked them to look at the Philippines Statistics Authority data and then map out the uh, production of these different vegetables around the country. So this is what they came up with. So this is a useful material, not only for the course, but as a reference material in the future. On the other side of the screen is the cacao primary processing. So this is usually nar narrated to students, and one of the output is just to um, list down the um, process of um, processing cacao. But this student was very innovative okay, to submit this um, kind of output. So it just shows um, how creative they are, they are and how we can enhance it to um, uh, to get more from them or to um, explore their great potential. Okay, so aside from um, how we teach them in classroom, it is also important to be connected with them outside classroom. So we have the, quali uh, the quality of the learning is enhanced through different educational platforms. Although I wasn't um, able to show it here, but I myself use Edmodo as an educational platform to post some messages to my students, announcements um, on their um, course requirements. I share them the, the slides that I presented in class so they can um, study more on their own time and um, also post some assignments. I also post, they, they, they also use that platform to exchange ideas with their classmates. Like if they, they have this group report, they need to share some data. That is the platform that they use. Um, they also, um, they can also check their student, uh, their progress in terms of their academic, academic standing through that platform. Google Classroom is another example. So there are a number of um, platforms that are available and these platforms are for free. Okay, um, teaching and learning activities need also to be enhanced um, the lifelong learning ability of the students. And um, in our university, we, want, we are very concerned about this. Hence, we do, um, we allow our students to do independent research through thesis or special problem. So we give them some research problems. They do some experiments and then they, through the guidance of the advisor, they um, discuss, um, they, they set up the experiments, generate data, analyze the data, and come up with a manuscript to report what they have found out in their study. Similarly, with um, major practice option, this is um, a visit or the, the students are allowed to immerse in some community to learn um, the best practices in the community and um, based on their learnings, what they can share in the community if um, there, there is a need for some improvement in the, in the community. Okay. Um, like what I've mentioned in the previous slide, we also allow our students to participate in exchange programs because we, we believe that um, learning from other culture will also be, be very beneficial for them. Although this um, participation to exchange programs, student exchange programs, requires some cost. So we need to prepare some fundings on this. Um, not all students or not all universities have the luxury to spend in exchange um, in student exchange programs. Okay, and um, like um, what the outcomes-based education is into, 
it is all about the students. We want them, we want to know what they learn. It is uh, on what they learn, what they experience, and what they can apply for their future. So when you employ them, um, we, we need to prepare as to what they can apply in their, in their workplace. And um, I just want to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues, uh, Prof. Emmanuel Bernardo, for sharing his inputs in the following courses, Agri-31, Agri-32, and Horticulture-20 course, uh, courses or classes, and then the Office of the Research and Extension of the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, UPLB. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martina, for inviting me in this um, webinar. Uh, it's a great experience, and I hope I have imparted to you um, uh, some of my experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanet, uh, for your very inspiring uh, presentation on how you are making uh, your classroom fun. And I think that our participants may have appreciated also the fact that uh, the focus here is, is more or like encouraging students to present and, uh, uh, you know, um, learn their communication skills uh, through oral presentations rather than written output. I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, they also probably appreciate uh, your presentation of uh, learning by doing, how you are engaging students also in creating this edible landscaping, which is very innovative. Yes. Mm -hmm and also how you are harnessing their creative minds, which I think is very important. And this is what, uh, this is something that we have been trying to uh, also emphasize in this webinar. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And for accepting our much. invitation at such a, such a short notice. So uh, now it's time to look at some of the questions that came. And I think uh, there will be more coming to you also. Uh, if you look at uh, the speakers, please, if you can look at the chat, and see uh, what kind of comments uh, we have been receiving from our participants. Um, there is a, a question to uh, Dr. to Dilek okay. on uh, potential impact of augmented reality to promote interactive learning. So maybe we can come to this. We are going to probably jump to, from speaker to speaker. So I would like to ask uh, Dilek to answer the question that has been addressed to him. Oh, thank you, Martina. The question. Oh, now I can see the participants also. Now and they can uh, see you. Very good. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Vice Chancellor, this is a very good question. And once again, you proved Tamil Nadu Agricultural University always be ahead of thinking all these things. I did not cover the virtual reality and augmented reality in my presentation, assuming like it's too early to discuss this platform, but that's extremely a good question. And let me explain you the evolution of the education technology. After the on-site, we started seeing the open distance learning, sending the materials to the learners, and getting their feedback and everything. And then maybe we started using this CBT, IBT, computer-based technology and the internet-based technology. Then in the CBT, we use it to send the CD-ROMs and still enable them to experience this computer-based technology learning. And then the IBT brought this online. In later stages, we started seeing these learning management systems and the learning content management. And during this phase, to enable users to be part of the classroom, there are some applications that brought into the picture. How we can combine the virtual world with the on-site world, there are some platforms like Second Life where we can insert our enable the students to immerse in this platform. And nowadays we are living in a highly advanced the computational technology world where we talk about the virtual reality and the augmented reality. No doubt it gives the much, much better experience and already 
some educational institutions here in the US, as well as even in India, they are using this one. Especially in the surgical procedures to explain the students, I did not show in my small video snippet so how we can combine various learning objects together, like the data, video, and everything. And Vice Chancellor, if you would have an opportunity to visit this part of the world, you are most welcome to visit to the campus, Iowa State University campus, because this is where you could see the highest resolution virtual reality C6 environment and where we can immerse ourselves. The difference between the virtual reality and the augmented reality is augmented reality, we actually correlate with the realistic world with the virtual reality. Let me give an example of how fascinating to the students this kind of experience. When I was studying, teach, learning about the leaf, I used to understand like what's the nucleus, mitochondria, rhizobium in a cell structure of a leaf. But I can, I can make a student to get into the leaf and touch and feel the rhizobium and the mitochondria. But this requires a six-sided wall and advanced projectors and everything. But now we can bring this one with the mobile phones and the apps and everything. So how fascinating it is. See how, what kind of interaction we are bringing up this one. So we are enabling students to touch the mitochondria and we are enabling students to touch the nucleus, allow them to feel that one. In the similar way, like if you can look at the medical education and we can actually project to the real human being and the next image we can show the student the skeleton of uh, the human being and how the different parts are projected in that one. You could see the difference in a typical classroom, the instructor could explain that one. But in this one, the interaction could be higher. We can make the student feel that one and register in their mind. That's the powerful the technology could bring in. So this could be easily adapted. And I could also give another example, the easiest way to understand. So in a virtual reality world, I can swim with the sharks. But in a augmented reality, I can bring a shark through a business card or a visiting card. So this is definitely useful, but agriculture education needs to reach that level to bring the experience to the student. I'm sure like uh, having leaders like you at the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, definitely it would uh, bring that kind of approaches to that particular part of the world. I'm happy to provide any assistance if you would like to introduce into your university through Apari. Ravi always thinks about these beautiful approaches and technologies too. I hope this helps and uh, clarifies your question. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you, Dilep. Uh, okay, there's another question. I think it's addressed to Mariette. Um, is there any standardized course framework to design experiential learning courses? Okay, Mariette, I think that's question, that question is for you yeah. regarding your courses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I think the learning in steps, so the learning staircase that I showed, I think this, this can serve as like a model for um, experiential learning. And then in... Uh, the support we provide, we, we look at with you for each step, how should you design? So if, um, if you look at the core exercise eh, where students actually pr uh, practice, one of the key elements needs to be uh, that the, the practice, that the experience is positive, that students are successful. Um, so for that, you need to have in place certain, certain conditions. How can I simulate an almost real life situation? They also need clearly to have like a checklist which describes um, what they should do to, in order to perform the skill uh, correctly. So it's like a rubric, but then translated into a very practical checklist. So 
these are two elements that helps to design your core exercise. And hopefully uh, we are able to organize with APARI uh, a session together. So then for each step in this learning staircase, in learning by steps, we will design together with you um, your course and you can practice with this conceptual framework. I hope this answered the question. And I also saw another question of the... Uh,